Well, good morning um, or good afternoon or good evening, wherever you are in the world. Uh, welcome to this Keating um, Princeton Mason seminar. Um, I'd like to extend the warm welcome to all of you who decided to join us this morning. Um, my name is Abdul Junadi. I'm a barrister at Keating Chambers. Um, joining us this morning, we have two excellent speakers. And I say that no, with no total sincerity, fantastic speakers. We have firstly, David Welhamed. He's an advocate barrister in South Africa, uh, calls to the Johannesburg Bar and, and Mazes Group, and an international member of Keating Chambers, London. Uh, fun fact, David was my pupil many, many, many moons ago. Um, he specializes in all aspects of engineering, construction, and related issues. And he has extensive domestic and international experience in high value and complex disputes in the high courts in South Africa, um, arbitrations and adjudications. Um, that was also a very passionate supporter of the spin box. <laughs> um, Mohammed Samri is our other excellent speaker. Um, he's a senior as associate at Vincent Mason's in Johannesburg. He's experienced in construction and engineering matters. Uh, Mohammed qualified as an attorney of the High Court of Africa in 2011. Uh, he spent two years as part of the legal counsel team at a global engineering consultancy, and the remainder of his career has been in private practice. Uh, largely spent advising on construction and infrastructure related projects and disputes. He had experience in contract drafting, rent negotiation, but his focus is on advisory and disputes work. He has worked extensively on a range of contracts, including FIDIC, the FIDIC Suites, NEC, JBBC, GCC, CIDB, and Procassive contracts. And he has a very keen interest in ADR processes and their ongoing development in the world. Uh, this morning, we are going to be discussing um, adjudication and particularly adjudication in the African context. Um, it is an increasingly popular form of dispute resolution um, on the continent. Um, the continent, I think probably fair to say, is behind other parts of the world in terms of the development of adjudication. I think we're fast catching up. Um, David is going to be giving us essentially a background, sort of basic adjudication 101 for about 10 to 15 minutes. Mohammed will then talk about um, adjudication in the African context, um, again, for about 10 to 15 minutes. We will then have a discussion like dealing with particular, particular thorny issues that, you know, in our experiences, you know, the three of us we've come across in adjudication, uh, both as adjudicator, in my case, and, 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 and as counsel. Um, and then we'll open up to questions from the floor. Um, could I please invite and encourage um, the people who are joining the webinar to please send their questions to um, the panel. Um, there should be a, a, a Q&A button on your webinar, um, on your Zoom um, platform. We just put the questions in there. And um, when we get to the question and answer session at the end, I will pose a question to the um, speakers. So without much further ado, could I then please invite David to please give us his 10 to 15 minutes on, on adjudication. Thank you, Abdul. Thank you for the introduction. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, wherever you are. And welcome to our lecture. Um, can I just add that, just add a rider to Abdul's introduction. Um, about 16 years ago, I was his pupil in London. And in spite thereof, I'm still in practice. So. Um, you went there, I have to retaliate. Uh, by way of introduction, um, adjudication is the dispute resolution process that construction practitioners are most likely to come across during a construction project. It is typically and it is designed to be a time and cost limited procedure, and it's aimed at delivering certainty at a particular point in a construction dispute, usually cash flow, and it is of, it is a temporary and binding effect uh, leading to a more elaborate uh, debate or discussion in arbitration or even litigation. And it is for this reason subsequently frequently referred to as a pay now, fight later, or, a, or a, 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 it's also referred to unfortunately as a quick and messy, which it often is. But it is part of the panoply of alternative dispute resolution procedures and it is, like Abdul said, a relatively new um, uh, weapon in the arsenal of construction, uh, lawyers, dispute man uh, managers, etc. A very useful description of the uh, almost a, a complete summary 
of the adjudication process was given in the first uh, adjudication matter which came before the English courts, where Judge Dyson in the matter of Makob, the civil engineering and Morrison construction, summarized the process as follows. And I must just add that this is in the context of the, Con the Construction Act, where in the United Kingdom, uh, adjudication is, is, is regulated by statute and is a compulsory a step or a hoop to jump through before you go to arbitration and litigation. So what Judge Dyson says is the following. He says, the intention of Parliament in enacting the Act was plain. It was to introduce a speedy mechanism for settling disputes in construction contracts on a provisional interim basis and requiring the decision of adjudicators to be enforced pending the final determination of dispute by arbitration, litigation, or agreement. I can just add from experience at this stage that if you have a good adjudication with a good adjudicator, it, there is often no arbitration, and it is quite frequently the end of the matter. But I'll get more about more, I'll say more about that later. The, the judgment then goes on to say the timetable for adjudications is very tight. Many would say unreasonably tight and likely to result in injustice. Parliament must have taken, must have been aware of this. So far as procedure is concerned, the adjudicator is given a fairly free hand. And it is true, but hardly surprising that he is required to act impartially. I will deal with the, ju the jurisdiction of the adjudication later because it is extremely important. He is, however, permitted to take the initiative in ascertaining the facts and the law, and he may therefore conduct an entirely inquisitorial process, or he may, as in the present case, invite representations from the parties. It is clear that Parliament intended that the adjudication should be conducted in a manner with those familiar with the grinding details of the traditional mm -hmm. approach to the resolution of construction disputes, apparently find sometimes difficult to accept. I'm not sure if that statement still holds true because adjudication has become uh, such a popular and, and, and um, frequently encountered method of resolving disputes. But Parliament has certainly not abolished arbitration and litigation of construction disputes. It has merely in, in, introduced an intervening provisional stage in the dispute resolution process. Critically, it has made it clear that the decisions of adjudicators are binding and are to be complied with until the dispute is finally resolved. I think that pretty much, in a nutshell, um, gives a very, very clear uh, description of the adjudication process. A con an adjudication contract, in the absence of statute law, like we find in the, in the United Kingdom, Australia as well, I think New Zealand, but uh, certainly not in South Africa, is the the terms of the the essentialia of the of the um, adjudication uh, uh, contract must at least provide for the following. It must provide for the appointment of the adjudicator in the referral notice, um, usually by the referring party. It must require that the adjudicator come to a decision within a specific number of days. And that's the whole purpose of adjudication is to get a swift, swift justice, get cash flow and um, get on with the project. And then if, if you're not satisfied, if, if the responding party or whichever party is not satisfied, then go on to arbitration or litigation, but with a binding award in order to ensure cash flow. Uh, thirdly, at least it must require that the adjudicator act impartially the rules of natural justice must apply. Body uh, and in South Africa, all sides must be heard. No fraud, no undue influence, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, at least the contract must provide that the adjudicator may take the initiative in ascertaining facts and the law. In other words, the adjudicator has quite wide jurisdiction, and. Uh, the adjudicator will be uh, immune against uh, claims uh, f following um, his actions. And then, of course, lastly, but uh, probably most important, is that the decision of the adjudicator will be binding until the dispute is finally uh, settled or determined by legal proceedings 
by way of arbitration or whatever procedures follows. These provisions, although not regulated by statute, is adopted in South Africa and is, is, is exclusively followed. Uh, I must just add that the, the enforcement of the adjudication award is probably the most important um, aspect which gives adjudication its teeth because running through the whole process and not making the award enforceable immediately sort of defeats the purpose. Adjudication is a very powerful tool for a party who is properly geared up for the rigors of a swift and rough and ready uh, dispute resolution uh, process. From experience, I can tell you the following. One often finds that the responding party, or the, the referring party, has, has a very, very substantial advantage because it can take several months to see a dispute down the line, such as a payment certificate, debatement of account, whatever the case may be. And the referring party has the, 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 the tactical advantage of time. And time is of the essence in an adjudication. And for that reason, if you are the responding party, the, the, you must immediately employ all possible resources because timelines are tight. So it is an enormously tactically efficient um, a method of resolving of resolving uh, uh, construction disputes. The example that I have just referred to is often referred to as ambush adjudications. And of course, you know, it is very, very effective. Moving then on to the rules of the adjudication. Um, rules and processes differ from contract to contract. Adjudication is generally a, a very informal process, and the adjudicator takes the initiative in establishing the facts of a case before coming to a decision. Experience tells us that the, the vague nature of the procedure may on occasion, and specifically in relation to complex disputes, uh, lead to an unsatisfactory process where the party's expectations as to how a matter is to be is to proceed or not met. It may be very useful for a construction professional to be consulted prior to the agreement uh, of the construction contract to suggest um, that provisions are made for further and additional rules of adjudication in the contract to ensure that all parties know what they're in for and how the procedure will be conducted. Uh, such a, a, a usually an experienced uh, a construction practitioner will also be known or will be in a position to explain pitfalls and to manage expectations, costs, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. There are a host of, of uh, standard form contracts with different adjudication rules: FIDIC, the NEC, the JCC, JBCC in South Africa. Um, uh, the Association of Arbitrators in South Africa have got a set of rules. The Arbitration Foundation have got rules. But more or less, these rules provide for similar uh, uh, key aspects. Referral, the appointment of the adjudicator, the manner in which the disputes must be set out, uh, timelines, um, the indemnification of the adjudicator, and of course, probably most importantly, the enforcement of the award. So the rules sort of go to and fro between these essentials of the adjudication uh, contract. Uh, to the best, some rules uh, uh, places a, 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 a fee cap on the process. I know that in the UK, the uh, TEXA has a fee cap and in the ICC I've encountered a fee cap, I think some 70,000 US dollars is the cap for the adjudicator in the in the ICC. Um, but like I say, most of these rules are, you know, the same, same, but different. So first of all, uh, there is the adjudication notice. This is the first step to get the adjudication up and running. Typically, an adjudication notice will read, this is a notice of intention of the referring party 
to refer an adjudication to a dispute with the responding party X pursuant to clause Y of the contract, and the contract will then be named. It will have a heading of parties, party X is the referring party, party Y is the responding party. It will have a heading with a dispute, um, setting out the dispute. This is a dispute between the parties regarding payment certificate 17 issued on so-and-so date and whether it is enforceable, et cetera, et cetera. So the, 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 the adjudication notice is a sort of a preempting notice. Good advice to the responding party. Or the, the, once you get this notice, immediately start employing resources, get your witnesses together, because it might be the only chance that you are um, that 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 you're going to get to 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 state your case. So different contracts and different sets of rules. Um, uh, provide what should be contained in the adjudication notice, but it's more or less the same. It's sort of a summary of what is about to come. In any event, experience dictates that the, the adjudication notice must be drafted carefully so as to avoid unnecessary disputes about the nature and the extent of what had been referred to the adjudicator for decision. Take care and, 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 and draft it with sufficient de um, detailed and clarity. Careful attention should be paid when drafting the adjudication notice. And in my experience, more rather than less is better. Uh, better to put more information to, in your notice than, uh, th than less. Secondly, follows the appointment of the adjudicator. And this is of absolutely critical importance. In an ideal scenario, the parties to a contract agree on an adjudicator prior to the commencement of the works. Um, this has the benefit that when a dispute arises during uh, the contract, it is simply a matter of drafting your notice, drop it on the other side. You have an adjudicator, the adjudicator's powers are already um, contracted on, and you can have a rough and ready dispute resolution. Uh, the it also has, in my experience, the effect that the parties have confidence in the adjudicator and in his abilities. And there's, least, there's less resistance of enforcing the award. Of course, a problem with this type of, of mentioning or sort of identifying an adjudicator beforehand is that he might become unavailable. The, the, the logical solution to that is to perhaps identify more than one adjudicator um, although this may lead to some, some, some acrimony in the process, um, something lawyers is not uh, adverse to. The, um, the adjudicator may also be agreed on by the parties when a specific dispute um, arise. The problem with leaving agreement to the appointment of the adjudicator until after the dispute has arisen is that the, the, the appointment of, the, of the, the adjudicator at the dispute stage can be very acrimonious and, and also very time consuming and quite cost intense, which completely defeats the purpose of an adjudication. So my advice would most certainly be uh, agree on an adjudicator um, before the commencement of, of the works. There is then also the fallback position that if the adjudicator is not available or the parties can't come to an agreement, that an adjudicator nominating body can uh, advise the parties on, on the appointment of an adjudicator. It's less than ideal because you want an adjudication. It's almost you get an opportunity to decide upon a specific judge or an arbitrator. So it's less than ideal to get appointed an adjudicator to a dispute um, with an engineering background who you really need um, someone with, with a legal background or where you have a quantification issue, you, you, you want a, 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 a qualified quantity surveyor rather than a lawyer. So that would be third option in my opinion. Then follows, once the adjudicator has been appointed, there follows the referral notice. Now the referral notice is the document that contains all the information which the referring party wants 
to put before the adjudicator in order for him to make a decision. The purpose is to make a decision in the reporting party's favor. So that you should draft your notice with the aim of persuading the adjudicator to, to make a finding on a balance of probabilities in your favor. The referral notice is not like a pleading, but it's more like a submission in an arbitration. So it's quite informal, but make sure that you add all the detail. In my experience, at least the following should be in your referral notice. There should be a very clear statement of the dispute identified in the adjudication notice, and that should be repeated in the in the in the referral notice. So, you've... secondly, there should be a complete explanation of the claim. You want, as a referring party, to have the matter decided in your favour, and you must do so on a balance of probabilities. So, it is, it is critical to set out the basis of your claim. At the very least, the identity of the parties, the contract, the relevant contract documents, the relevant terms of the contract, what obligations the responding party is said not to have complied with, and how what loss the referring party is suffering, as well as the calculation of the loss. So those are, are basic things that needs to be in. Um, of course, and this is quite a contentious problem, quite a contentious issue. Every single last document that you want to rely upon in the adjudication must be attached to your notice. Um, in addition there to, of course, there can be witness statements. So it's a bundle of your claim goes in your notice. Uh, experience dictates that sometimes it's very difficult to include additional documents. And almost inevitably, in every dispute, you, you during, as a result of the tight timelines, a further a very important document is discovered and needs to be included. I'll deal with that aspect a little bit later. Then it's always useful in your, in your referral notice to make a summary at the end um, of points of law that you want to decide on. Uh, and it's summarized, it's useful to summarize the answers to the disputes that are referred. So, so to provide the adjudicator with a certain degree of assistance and saying, this is the problem, this is the answer, this is the reason, this is the foundation in law, um, and this is what I want, that, that, that sort of logic. Uh, it is important to bear in mind that very often in adjudications, and specifically those run, that are run effectively, that the referral notice may very well be the only opportunity, and I emphasize only opportunity um, to make your case. Uh, and um, that should be borne in mind when you draft your notice. In fact, you can always assume that if it is done properly, this is going to be the only time that you're going to make your case. Uh, frequently, um, and in, in my experience, it's, it's, it's quite useful. There is a request for a meeting or a hearing. It may be that the dispute is so complicated or for some other reason, a face-to-face -face meeting is useful, or for example, where witness statements are relied upon. Uh, this should also be requested in the referral notice. So the, if the referring party wants uh, um, a hearing or a meeting it should be requested in the referral notice. Uh, in my experience, quite often the adjudicator uh, calls for a meeting in any event. Um, uh, and but but, but the, the, the crux being that such a request should expressly be made. Logically, it follows that the responding party will then have an opportunity to file their, their papers. Um, and yet again, I've, I've touched the point, but as far as possible, um, it's very prudent to anticipate an adjudication. So when the, when the notice falls, employ your resources, get yourself ready, anticipate the dispute, because you're going to walk into a very, very tight timeline. And those timelines David, are contradictory. David, sorry to interrupt. You're talking of timelines. Um, I'm, I'm looking at the time. Um, can we... I'd like to give Mohammed a chance to like to make to make his own 
presentation. So can we, can we wind it up? I can, I can certainly wind it up. My apologies. Thank you. For that. Um, sorry, I was, I, was, I was going on. Um, I'm just going to touch one last aspect um, uh, of tool, which I think is of, of critical, of critical um, importance. And that is, bear in mind that right or wrong, in law or in fact, um, the adjudication award is enforceable. Now, in South Africa, this is very simple. You place the matter on the motion court trial, you get an award and it's enforceable and you, can, you must pay. In the UK, there is a, a process similar to in South Africa, the summary judgment process. I would not advise that to be followed because it's very easy to raise a bona fide dispute and you find yourself in the fourth division months after the fact and your adjudication has been a waste of time. The, the, ladies and gentlemen, um, I thank you very much for your time. This is a, a short adjudication 101. Um, there are numerous other aspects but I'm sure Mohammed will raise that. I thank you very much for your time. Thanks, Abdul. David, thank you very much. I mean, I, I, you were given a, an inevitable task trying to um, summarize the adjudication in, in 25 or so minutes, but you did an, ex an excellent job. Thank you very much, David. Thanks um, for the opportunity. Can I invite Mohammed, can I invite you please now to make your presentation on, on, on adjudication, looking at it particularly from an African context? Perfect. Thank you very much, Abdul. Um, just as a starting point, maybe to make the point that um, there are many African countries which are currently experiencing an infrastructure or economic growth at the moment. Um, and a byproduct or an unavoidable byproduct of that at times is an increase in, in disputes. Um, we see that the contracts un under which uh, such disputes arise often include a tiered dispute res resolution process, um, which itself includes adjudication, either expert adjudication or, or otherwise. Um, this tiered dispute process is found in most widely used international standard form contracts, uh, particularly within the con uh, projects and construction environment. Uh, that is not to say that such um, processes are limited to these industries and contracts, as we have seen the expansion into other fields and also into bespoke contracts. Also, we see it in local standard form contracts in South Africa, for instance, in the JBCC. Um, I'll turn it to adjudication more specifically. The process, we see it gain, gaining more popularity in Africa as a dispute resolution tool. Um, having said that, there still seems to be room for, for it to improve or, and, or to expand uh, the, the overall use on the continent. I say that because there seems to be a varying degree or, or varying practices or attitudes from country to country or region to region uh, insofar as the approach to adjudication is concerned. If we, if we look at it from a, from a South African context, for, for instance, there are a number of indicators which point towards the established use of adjudication in South Africa, like David has already mentioned. Um, some of these factors include that there's already a well-developed body of case law dealing with issues which often arise in an adjudication context. Um, these issues include jurisdiction, powers of the adjudicator, enforcement of awards and the like. Um, there's also the availability of specialized adjudication rules such as the 2014 JBCC adjudication rules. Mm. Uh, there also exists um, particular specialized bodies such as the Arbitration Foundation of South Africa or the SS Association of Arbitrators um, in South Africa, uh, which also have their own rules and to whom you can apply for the appointment of, of an adjudicator. Um, lastly, on a governmental level, the South African government itself has sought to promote adjudication through a white paper titled Creating an environment for reconstruction, growth, and development in the construction industry. Um, turning away from South Africa, if we look at, at Kenya, for example, dispute resolution mechanisms in Kenya are anchored in the law. Article 159 of the Con Kenyan Constitu Constitution stipulates that in exercise of judicial authority, courts must, and tribunals, must promote alternative forms of dispute resolution, including reconciliation, mediation, arbitration and traditional dispute resolution mechanisms. Um, although adjudication is not specifically mentioned, notable is that there already seems to be a platform to argue for the increased of, um, use of adjudication. If we look at Zambia as another example, again, dispute resolution in the form of conciliation, mediation and arbitration is also relatively entrenched. Um, once again, though, there's no legal framework or express legal framework for, for adjudication. 
uh, this issue has been recognized and certain commentators have noted that the importance and importance of an adjudication practice which is supported by the law cannot be over overemphasized um, especially in a developing country like Zambia with major construction projects ongoing Turning away, maybe looking at the opposite end of the spectrum in Tanzania, for instance, unlike in relation to arbitration awards, an, adjudication, an adjudicator's decision is not enforceable in its, in its own right. So taking stock, I mean, looking at those examples, there seems to be this varying uh, approach to adjudication, but there is a drive or a popularity or gaining in popularity for adjudication as a tool. If we had to contend then for the increased or the continued increased use of adjudication on the continent, an immediate question that, that may be asked is, what are the benefits of adjudication from, from an African perspective? And just very briefly, and, and David's already dealt with this, adjudication is intended to be an interim measure provided through a quick cost-effective and less formal process of resolving disputes. If these aims are achieved, it, it enables parties to move on from the distraction of disputes and actually focus on their attention on the, the, the actual project and getting on with, with what needs to be delivered. When you consider that against the urgent need for um, infrastructure in certain African countries and how imperative it is to avoid wasteful expenditure, the benefits that could flow from adjudication, I think, are, are self-evident. But this also applies to the, the private sector where there's need to ensure positive cash flow in, in ever fluctuating markets. Um, I, th I think another point on, on the benefit is that if the parties don't stipulate a dispute process and must instead go to court to solve their disputes, then I think we know that court processes are generally more procedural in nature and they can also be quite protracted. Um, another issue from that is, uh, unlike in the United Kingdom, which has a specialist um, Court for technology and construction matters, there aren't such courts in, that exist in Africa. Adjudication therefore allows the parties the opportunity to appoint an adjudicator with the appropriate technical skill and or experience for that particular matter as determined by the parties themselves. Um, I think that level of comfort um, and certainty cannot be guaranteed in a, in a court context. And I think it's a benefit that can't be taken lightly either because most, if not all of disputes will undoubtedly benefit from, from being adjudicated upon by a third party or combination of third parties with specific backgrounds, be it legal, engineering, delay or quantum. Um, one further aspect for consideration is that already prior to and more so during the COVID-19 pandemic, there's been an increased use of, of virtual platforms for adjudication. Um, there is, I submit, the potential for the benefits I've already mentioned to be enhanced as, as a result of, of this um, use of virtual platforms. If we look at large-scale disputes, whether in, in Africa or otherwise, you, you'll often find that the parties involved and maybe even the adjudicators or representatives are from different countries or even continents, and all of them with their own busy schedules um, and, and diaries. If we utilize virtual hearings or we try and encourage the use of virtual hearings. I, I, some of the benefits that, that come out of, of that for me are, th there's gonna be costs which are curtailed by avoiding travel costs or having to secure a venue for any hearing that might be necessary. If you remove the travel time, there's potential for, um, for it to be easier to fit in virtual hearings into the busy schedules I've mentioned. And lastly, remote hearings again means that the parties are free to appoint adjudicators and representatives from anywhere in that particular country, Africa more broadly, um, or in fact, the rest of the world. Um, in conclusion then, from my side, I think it seems adjudication is being entrenched as a popular choice of process in Africa, or it has room certainly to be entrenched as such. Personally, I would, in, I would certainly encourage that the trajectory continues because if it's applied correctly, adjudication could shorten disputes, thus reducing the number of disputes at any given time, which would ultimately be to the benefits of the, the parties and the projects they're involved in. Um, thank you. Excellent. Thank you very much, Mohammed. Uh, well, we are, we've, we'll now move on to the more sort of the conversational discursive part of the webinar. And um, with the permission of the speakers, I'd like to just change things up a little bit. Um, they've had a couple of excellent questions put forward by members of the audience. I think i um, like to deal before we deal with um, the problems that we were going to discuss. Um, we had, a, we had a, a question from one of the uh, attendees. 
parties asking, I think, I think it's directed that, that uh, would you advise parties to name prospective adjudicators in their contracts or would it be better to name a nominating authority? Uh, uh, yeah, that's a very, very good question. In, in, a, in the adjudication market, and I can only speak for South Africa, it is tried that it is, it, it's, it's, it's not a big market. It, we all know that construction laws is, is, a, is a specialist area. And the net result thereof is that there are specialist adjudicators. And they are well known. Um, there's a panel of adjudicators, both in AFSA, as well as in the association, as well as in the engineering council. These are competent people. Uh, we all know that there are very competent advocates and, and attorneys who are very good at adjudic uh, uh, adjudicators. In my opinion, play safe, appoint an adjudicator by agreement or two or three to see you, three, four, five, to see who's available. And if all the parties are happy with them and uh, uh, it, it, it certainly avoids getting being disillusioned, you know, by, by getting an adjudicator, which you, nobody knows, don't know his abilities. Um, my advice would be a, a, appoint an adjudicator before the time. Interesting. Mohamed, do, do you have a view on that? Do you think it's better to, 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 to name one or to use a nominating body? Uh, I, I generally agree with what, what David said. I think it adds a, a level of comfort. There can be no room for um, later negative um, attitudes or whatever might might happen if the parties up front have already uh, agreed who they feel are best suited for their disputes. And I think perhaps if it's parties who've contracted before or who know particular people uh, in the industry, again, suited to their particular projects and their particular needs as parties to that contract, I think it makes, it makes sense to nominate where you can. Excellent. I just want to add to what Mohammed is saying. I think it's very, very important to realize that in the United Kingdom, you have the benefit of statutory adjudication. We don't have that. It, it follows therefrom that uh, the, the choice of the adjudicator is absolutely critical if you want a satisfactory result. So uh, I just add to, to what Mohammed is saying. Um, yeah. uh, the, point, the, the, the point I was making, what you find in the TCC in London is a bench who is practiced as construction barristers for years and they know the disputes they know the procedure they know it inside out better than than, than the barristers sometimes we don't have that so you have to choose your adjudicator very carefully and do your homework before you do that yeah well um, i mean just to throw my two pence in i mean i i, I would hardly endorse what dad was saying about the importance of the quality of the adjudicator and, it, and it's not i mean i mean i practice both as an adjudicator and as counsel in the uk right. and around the world i think the, the problem of the quality of adjudicator isn't just limited, isn't one that's, um, I mean, we have the same problem in the UK because you know, the decision to adjudicate is such powerful thing. I mean, the basis on which you could challenge them yeah. is very limited. So it's critical you get the right person. And you know, for a long time, it was sort of the wild west when it came to nominating bodies. They had it on their lists. Um, mm. Some nominating bodies didn't bother really checking qualifications. So you had a whole range of people who were quite clearly unsuitable adjudicators were being appointed time and time again on quite large disputes and you get some very very odd decisions coming out um which um while prima facie enforceable i mean you, they, they unless he's done something he or she has done something utterly you know ludicrous like straying outside the jurisdiction or breaching the rules of natural justice you have a decision that is that is um enforceable which um you will have to which you know it it, it, it will be you know objectively barking mad <laughs> to, to, to coin a phrase um, but you have to abide by it, at least until you decide to go you know, to challenge it in arbitration or, or, um, or litigation. So, yeah, I think quality of, of, of panel or, or quality of um, tribunal is very important when it comes to adjudication. I think it's the Absolutely. most important part of an adjudication is yeah. to have a strong adjudicator. Yeah. Um, Mohammed, there's a question here that directs at you. Um, are the courts in Africa upholding and enforcing the adjudication decisions where the parties do not comply or is there uncertainty whether they will be upheld? Again, I think it, it varies region to, to region, Abdul, and it's, it's one of those things that need to be developed. And I think the more certainty that can be introduced, whether it's to, through statute or, statute or through the robustness of the court's uh, approach to it, um, I think it, it's a varying um, level of approach at the moment, but the more certainty that can be garnered into it, 
the more attractive adjudication will become because uh, I think David mentioned earlier that enforcement is one of the critical uh, aspects when, it, when, you, when you're dealing with adjudication. Yeah, I can, David, I mean, what, what's also a view? So, sorry, sorry, Abdul. It's been upheld in South Africa in the tubular holdings matter that the adjudicator's award is enforcing, is in a, sorry, is enforceable um, uh, without exception almost. Um, then there's another interesting aspect that's matter uh, is that one adjudicator's decision is also binding on another adjudicator's decision. Mm. But in, in, I can certainly speak for uh, jurisdictions where I have been instructed, South Africa, Namibia, and Botswana, those decisions are, up, uh, are upheld by, 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 by the courts mm. um, and, and, and made an order of court upon presentation of the award. I think Zambia is, is to a large degree regulated by British law with some nuances. I'm, I'm speaking off the cuff here. So I would expect that, in, that Zambia would also, um, the Zambian courts would also uphold um, an adjudicator's award. I can't speak for Angola or, or uh, Mozambique in sub-Saharan Africa because they follow Portuguese law. So I've got absolutely no idea. I think, I mean, if I, make it, if I can chime in with my, with my experience, I think in my experience of the approach of um, judiciaries to adjudication on the continent, I think both the number that I would have, have alluded to depend very much on where you go. Um, those jurisdictions that have a familiarity with the process, um, yeah. particularly South Africa, are very good in the sense that you know, they are the established processes for ensuring that the decisions are enforced and it's quick in the, in the way that it's meant to be. Other jurisdictions less so. Um, Partly because I think of a basic lack of familiarity with the process, because adjudication is, as I said at the outset in the introduction, it is a fairly new process when it comes in Africa, and there are many jurisdictions where um, the judiciary simply is not familiar with the process. And when you think about, it, you stand back and look at it objectively. What you're asking the court to do is quite an extraordinary thing. Um, you are asking them to enforce without scrutiny, without any um, um, review. Um, except for some very, very narrow parameters, decisions of another tribunal. Now, we know from the history of courts generally in, 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 in the UK that um, courts tend to guard their jurisdiction very jealously and persuading an, a, a, a court to effectively hand over that process to, some, to another body is very difficult. I mean, in the UK, it required legislation to do it. And you also have the additional problem that in Africa, in many, many, many African countries, you have constitutions that guarantee um, a right of access to courts by for parties. So I've I've come across situations where, you know, under a fiddic contract, you have a decision of an adjudicator trying to enforce it rather than going through the, the arbitral process, trying to trying to enforce it in a court, and we're met with with constitutional arguments. Arguments being that well, the constitution of country X says that I, as an individual, am entitled to have my day in court. And by you going through this process, you're depriving me of my day in court. Therefore, you know, you shouldn't enforce this. Um, and, you know, in that case, it, it, that argument actually won out. So I think to ask the question directly, I think it's a, um, it very much depends on the jurisdiction that you're, you're operating in. Some of them are very good. Others are not so good. Um, yes. The, just, I mean, while we're on, on the topic, I mean, David, in terms of, you know, your experience as, as, Council on adjudication, and uh, what 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 is your experience where you have a situation in adjudication which the rules don't cater for specifically? I mean, how how in your experience have uh, tribunals dealt dealt with that situation where you know something crops up in the adjudication that's not spelt out in the rules? Yeah, so that I I have I've encountered that on more than one occasion. Um, in, in that goes back. Up to, to to the the experience and the qualifications of the adjudicator, the courts in South Africa um, provide guidance in saying that the adjudicator is meant. Is, is I think it's the judgment of Judge uh, Judge Nugent. It is, the, it is the purpose of the adjudicator and it's his function to, to follow a robust approach. However, if you have a good adjudicator, um who's familiar with, with the general essentiality of the contract and the general process, he can easily say he has jurisdiction, he can adopt jurisdiction um, 
you know to 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 suit the process and he if if he has the the gravitas he can say do the following follow the following process so but it is a it's a very very difficult situation if you have a lightweight adjudicator who can then maybe call for a meeting between the parties and each party will have a self-serving suggestion which number one costs money takes time and defeats the purpose of the adjudication so it's a tricky question it's a tricky question but and and, and if there's no agreement on that point then the adjudication has come and gone so um yeah difficult situation Mohammed, do you have a view on this yeah just two things on my side abdul i think if it's the introduction of something or a step that wasn't initially contemplated and if it's raised by a party then i suppose adjudication being by agreement if not statutorily uh, mandated the parties could could see whether there is room for them to to agree and like david said then the adjudicator can adopt that as part as being part of his his jurisdiction if we're looking at a i think differently but perhaps there's an underlying point that i'll make just now but if we're looking at a party who's recalcitrant who's just not following the process because well he doesn't or she doesn't want to then i think the adjudication is is going to be doomed to fail because again for it to serve the purposes it sets out to serve i think you need parties who are who buy into that and they actually want it to to work so that to me runs through to to both points whether it's a, it's a bona fide aspect that comes about and the parties want to try and and introduce it or a recalcitrant party i think their approach is generally to it and and what they want to achieve from adjudication if it's a tick box or they actually want to achieve a meaningful uh, adjudication will be will be an important aspect i think just that, to that, that's what, an interesting sorry, sorry david go on, go david go on. my apologies for interrupting up to all i just want to add to what mohammed says and i think he makes a very important point if you have a recalcitrant um party and that happens we see we've all seen that happen then the adjudication will come and go one of the problems that we have in south africa and because it is the the this there's a there's a it's a small construction it's a small it's a, a small number of practic practitioners with specialist construction experience as you often find the appointment of a commercial advocate or a commercial attorney um who does construction law you know as and when he gets instructed to do so who is not so a favor the adjudication process and that's exactly where where, 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 where what mohammed is saying as i as i read it the, the adjudication can then completely fall by the wayside just because people are not familiar with the process what what to what extent is is it crucial then for adjudication to work to have as part of the rules the provision that the adjudicator is the master of his own procedure because it seems to me that if 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 the rules expressly provide that the adjudicator is the master of his own procedure then that gives the adjudicator an enormous amount of latitude um to ensure that um you know if problems occur that the rules don't deal with or we have a recalcitrant um recalcitrant uh party that he can fashion solutions to make sure that the adjudication isn't a bust to make sure it does actually perform a, perform a function okay. i think it's it's critical that the the um adjudication award must include a, a, a contractual term that the adjudicator has the as as the the powers to determine his own uh, jurisdiction well so is there a restriction or just a procedure i mean it's more about procedure isn't it david that we want to make sure that you know he can determine how he runs the adjudication and yes. that that's not open to challenge yeah it, it, you make a good point because some of the uh, in my experience what what often happens is you you get an adjudicator who calls for a meeting um to address specific questions to the parties that frequently happens but my advice would be draft an agenda which is agreed before the time because free, firstly the 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 aspects which the adjudicator wants addressed gets addressed with clear submissions and the agenda is recorded if you go into an into a meeting such as that without an agenda it frequently becomes a free for all and all sorts of aspects are raised at enormous cost and time mm -hmm. so uh, uh, if an adjudicator the point i'm making is if an adjudicator calls for a meeting in order to arrange a process 
set up an agenda before the time to make sure that, that, that you, you walk out of, out of that meeting with an answer, mm. you know, and not just another an acrimonious exercise which leads mm. nowhere. No. Mohammed, what do you think? Yeah, I, I think that's an interesting one. If the just speaking again to the purpose of adjudication, it's meant to be less formal. It's meant to be quick, for the reasons mm. we've we've spoken about. If if the parties want a lengthier, more procedural arbitration, then well, they they could have that. If they want an even lengthier, even more procedural court process, they could have that. So if they want adjudication, I think you've got to free up the adjudicator to to be able to achieve those aims. And yeah. and and again, it goes to the mindset of the parties. Um, of course, the, that's not to say the adjudicator is going to have free role or free play. He's still going to be bound by the the rules of natural justice and and those types of things. So giving him that additional ability to to ensure that the purpose is achieved, I think, is is important. Abju. Well, moving on, well, here's he, he the controversial one, I think, um, from a, a non-lawyer. Um, do you, the question, question posed from, 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 from the audience, do you think lawyers help or hinder adjudication? Mohammed? <laughs> um, I, I think it depends, Abdul. I think it, it, if you've gotten a practitioner who's, uh, to use David's words, or fair with the process and what, what it's meant to achieve, and if you've got parties who enable that practitioner to do that, um, I, I think there's benefit. There's benefit to keep the issues limited. There's benefit to keep the issues narrow um, and to try and resolve that dispute. So if you've got people trained in dispute resolution, um, I, I think there's benefit. At times, they might need assistance from from legal, um, uh, from technical or skilled persons. But I, I certainly think there's there's room to play for, for practitioners. David, what are your thoughts? Well, my gut feel is, of course, <laughs> but, but that's, um, I, 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 when I started practicing 20 years ago, the construction landscape was, was much different than it is now. I think it's a very, very good question that's posed by, by the member of the audience. The, the, the spirit of construction way back two decades ago was let's all work together to give the employer a fantastic product. That, that that ethic has has eroded to i think there is now no there is not a single dis, uh, contract project without dispute so i think the the in my opinion the answer to that question is if the parties need each other and let's say they've come a long way together and 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 they are specialists at what they do good relationships is always a fantastic thing you don't want disputes. They're costly. They, they, they waste time. They waste money. And, and lawyers can add to that or subtract from that point. I mean, it all depends on, on personalities. I mean, let's say you have a, a sensible advocate who can understand that the, 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 your, your, your client doesn't want to be in court or in an adjudication. They want to get on with the job. You can have someone who, who's got a more acrimonious personality or sort of, and, and, not, and not take that approach. So I think it's a horses for courses scenario, uh, but, um, and, and this is something that, that I've often been, been instructed with, give an opinion on process or get an opinion on process, get an opinion on merits, get an opinion on pitfalls, and then see if you can do it on your own. But if, it, if it's complex and there's uh, uh, complex aspects of law, I would most certainly take legal advice. Yeah. Well, yeah, I think the, the, it's interesting to hear your characterization that David of, of the construction industry. I think looking at it from a UK perspective, and this is unfortunately, or for, fortunately, if you're a lawyer, um, the culture in the, in the UK has long been one of which you know parties um, set out from the outset to try and make money from disputes in the, in the project. That's the fact, and and that's what led to um, the, the, the Latham review, which is what led to in part, the Construction Act, the attempt to change the culture of the construction industry in the UK to make it less acrimonious and more uh, partnering, make sure the party try and you know, um, work towards the objective of delivering the project rather than trying to make money off disputes. And unfortunately, um, you know, the what I call the UK malaise has been exported around the world because if you look at places where you know, the Middle East, for instance, where there are lots of you know, UK professionals, um, disputes have become a culture there as well. Now, speaking as a lawyer, I'm all for it. Um, but you can be, you, you sometimes you wonder whether or not that's you know, what's in the best interest of 
or of the client, whether you know, having fewer lawyers would actually you know, make for more outcomes. But I think that, that's a rather controversial topic that I think we'll, we'll leave for the time being. Um, another question from, from the audience, so what is the best way to qualify um, as an adjudicator? The, I'm, I'm aware that the, uh, uh, from, uh, purely speaking from a South African perspective, uh, there is a, a course run by the University of Pretoria in, in qualifying as an adjudicator. Uh, the Association of Arbitrators frequently have training courses and the Association of Arbitrations uh, also have, have training courses. Um, Though I, 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 can, I cannot and, and, and I cannot comment on the quality of those courses, but um, I think I, I think the best way is to qualify is to is to is, is experience. You know, once you've done one or two or ten, you become better at them. Simple as that. Mm. Both as an adjudicator as well as as a as a practitioner. Yeah, Mohammed, do you have anything any, any to add on that? I'm um, also uh, aware of those institutes offering um, courses uh, where you are able to qualify as, as an adjudicator, but a more general comment, I suppose, would be um, other than that, there, there are other institutes where you can list yourself as, as being available for adjudication. So if you've got particular expertise, legal or, or technical, um, to, to, to David's point, the, I, I suppose it comes from experience, uh, mm. putting yourself out in, into those organizations, getting your, your name out there. Abdul, can I just return to the to the previous questions about the involvement of 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 lawyers in disputes and whether course, they, they whether they add or subtract? Yeah. I just want to say this: one must just bear in mind that as a, as an advocate, you have a duty to your client in in all aspects, and that duty includes a commercial duty. You need to advise your client on the on the the cost aspects and the ethical aspects and a good commercial advocate and a good construction advocate in my opinion does his best to keep his client out of a dispute so i think you have a duty to your client bear that in mind i mean we have a bad reputation let's face it because disputes have become a culture like you correctly say mm -hmm. but that can be avoided you know with good advice mm -hmm. in, in my opinion the mark of a good construction advocate is to keep your client out of court yeah, very true. Mama, do you have anything to add to that? Um, I, I agree, Abdul. I think there's obviously the instances where it's unavoidable. And, and like David says, then it's in the interest of the client to to have that dispute. But in, in most other instances, I think dispute avoidance is should be part of the thought process. Yes. Yeah, yeah. yeah I think, yeah, the key word there is dispute avoidance. And of course, you have contracts at the NEC that are set up to try and avoid Mm. disputes by having early warning notices and, and also procedures in the, the contract to try and make sure that um you know you try and head off you see the dispute coming down the road and you take action early on to try and resolve them avoid the disputes um yeah hopefully you know, they, that, that will reduce the number of disputes um coming back to the question of you know how best to qualify as an adjudicator I, I, I think i agree with what both of you have said um i know that the rics in South africa runs courses on qualifying for um for adjudication um yeah, I think probably the best way in terms of gaining qualifications is to run ten of those courses, and the CIR also also do um, a similar course. So, you no, know, but there are. It's one thing to do the course and to get the qualification; it's a different thing to get the appointments, and I mean, that's where the, the real struggle comes. Because, yes. as David yes. said, I mean, people are going to be reluctant to appoint you um, unless they have experience. And then, well, how do I get experience unless I'm appointed? Now, that's that, that, that's that's always the problem. Um, but I think it, it's. Anybody who's interested in in disputes generally um, and acting as a, as a dispute resolver, um, I think um, adjudication is definitely a growing industry, and I would advise encourage anybody with an interest to 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 qualify. I mean, what's 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 the worst that can happen? Get another qualification. Um, well, gentlemen, I mean, I'm 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 I am aware of the time. It's now almost eleven o'clock. Um, I think we are. Uh, coming toward, we're coming to the end of the time we've allocated. Um, I think I'd just like to thank both of you, David and Mohammed, for um, your excellent contributions this morning. I thought they were really good, really interesting, fascinating. Um, we touched on a number of subjects, um, um, looking at education in, in, in African context. And one, one issue that I think that, that really did come out quite powerfully 
was the importance of making sure that you pick the right adjudicator for adjudication. I think courses for courses is very important in, the, in this context. And um, we also touched on the varying landscape across the continent when it comes to adjudication, um, how receptive some tribunals, some jurisdictions are, um, how other jurisdictions aren't, aren't quite there yet, but hopefully there will be. Um, adjudication is certainly a growing industry you know, across the continent. And um, in the next few years, um, I'm sure we'll see some um, some really significant developments, including, I think, um, in one or two jurisdictions, the introduction of, I think, statute-based adjudication. Um, and then the, a couple of countries have been, have been toying with, with the idea, um, just, just haven't got, gotten over the line yet. But I think in the next five years or so, I, I wouldn't be surprised if there were at least two jurisdictions that had um, a UK-style statute adjudication. Um, it's 11 o'clock. Um, thank you very much, David and, and, and Mohammed, for, for, for your thank contributions. You. And thank you very much for those of you who have taken the time out today to attend. And um, we will, I mean, there are um, other, th th there'll be more webinars in the series, in the Ke Keating Pincer Masons um, series. And um, I hope to see some or all of you at the next webinars. And now that, you know, we're, South Africa's opening up again to, um, to, 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 to visitors, hopefully next year we will reinstate the Keating Pincer um, Masons seminars uh, or, or um, events in person. So I look forward to seeing some all of you in person next year. Thank you very much. Thanks for everybody who attended. Thanks for your time. Thanks all.